So looking at implicit trust relationships in your organization, and then a couple of kind of low-level attacks, that's where I play. I have a talk next week at Syscan, which is looking at kind of CPU-level type stuff. And so looking at this more from a management, this is the management track, and uh, kind of taking some overview away from that. So uh, who am I? I work at a company called Assured Information Security. Uh, I live in Denver, like to ski, like to run, like to bike. Um, I'm one of Sergey's Langsat cultists. And uh, I like to play in places that not many people play, so SMM, VMM, and then BIOS level type stuff, as well as uh, operating system as well. And so I have a group of people out in Denver that, that, that do that with me. Uh, and I will be at the run tomorrow, and I hope all of you are as well. Yes, Brian, excellent. <laughs> So basically, we're going to go through a little bit here, um, some background. So I will actually talk about uh, a pretty low level or two, a couple low level attacks. And so just to bring everyone up to speed, at least to understand the impact, I'm going to go through some background. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, you know, mapping the trusted code base of every or application. And then you know, who you realize you don't realize you're trusting, but you are. So a lot of companies, they have a really nice process for vendor management. They, bring in, uh, especially after the target hack when their HVAC system provider got compromised and that was kind of the entry point. A lot of organizations have a really great process for vetting their vendors and like evaluating them and putting some teeth in a contract saying, well, if we get breached because of you, you're in trouble. Uh, there's a lot of vendors that you don't realize that you're kind of implicitly working with. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about a few of that. And then uh, the last one, kind of the management takeaway is, is kind of selling information security to your board or to your CIO or your CEO uh, and talking about kind of how you can track your investment and not be security folks are the ones always saying no. Like, oh, you built this product, it's going to go out to market and the security folks say, no, you can't do that because you're going to open this port on the firewall and we don't want to do that. So rather than being the naysayers, how you can invest yourself and involve yourself in earlier in the design process to be kind of a, a value add to your organization. With that, information security is, is seen as a cost of doing business. It's kind of like the security tax you pay. Uh, in our organization, we have very insular security conferences where we all feel like what we're doing is the most important thing in the world, but I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, but you know, we are there to support business goals. Like the most secure organization is one without any computers, without any employees. Uh, and that's not really a, you know, a very successful business. Um, so I've been talking with some CISOs and director of IT folks and kind of providing this adversarial mindset and thinking about how you should think about security because also the media is entirely skewed and that, you know, like uh, Haroon mentioned, um, you get the news about the NSA level attacks, which are not necessarily something that you as an organization, if you're director of IT security, are going to have to be concerned about. Um, you don't see the, the boring attacks like, oh, someone had a terrible password and then we compromised them or oh, someone had a computer under their desk they'd forgotten about and it wasn't kind of managed properly. So uh, I like to bring an attacker's perspective to the table and then help identify threats to your business and then how you can sell a return on investment. So uh, great keynote this morning helped lead in. This was the, the blog post, Chess versus Poker. And so a little bit more detail on that. So Research focuses on like elegance. So I thought of this when I was a kid. The newspapers had little chess problems. They have a chess board in a certain configuration, and it'll say something like, five moves to checkmate. And uh, you got to figure out from that kind of arbitrary starting point how you get to checkmate in a very kind of constrained way. And so that's kind of what we focus on. That's what we see at Black Hat. That's what we see on the Project Zero blog where you have this very cool attack, you know, like a one byte overflow that then transitions like 13% of the time into something that uh, you can then compromise in a certain setup with running certain versions of software. Whereas attackers and users, they don't really focus on what's happening, you know, from between the keyboard and wherever they're accessing. That's kind of like, that's just a, a transparent layer to them. They want to be able to look at pictures of their kids. They want to be able to do whatever they're doing shopping online and not really have to worry about that. And so we're over here solving these problems that are not relating to them. And a lot of what we say, what we think, and what we do is so far ahead of where they are that you know, we're kind of we're playing a different game. And they're playing poker where the adversaries have a model 
where they're incentivized not by speaking at Black Hat. You don't see people who go and do these attacks say, then this is how I hack Sony, and then they show this sweet rock chain they made. Because anything beyond just taking a password from the passwords.xl spreadsheet that was on their server is now losing them a return on investment. They're now investing money and time in something that's not going to benefit them. As long as they can get in and make some money, they're going to do it by the easiest way possible, because why would not? They're not incentivized the same way we are. So I'm rewarded for neat tricks and, and elegant exploits in a synthetic or fabricated environment. And then def defenders are rewarded for deploying solutions and new defenses. Just like the keynote said, you know, you feel really great when you plug in a new box and the green light shows on and now you're, you're Barracuda. You know, their slogan is network security, period, solved, period. And you see this especially in DC and the metro systems where all the, the government folks go. So they think, all right, I'll just plug this box in and, and I'm all set. And in fact, that's really not solving the problem. If you can make a product that would keep folks that you know, do these common sense things from doing them. So we all think, all right, great, good passwords. Don't email your credit cards in plain text. Don't, uh, you know, don't you know, click on links from emails from random people. If you could productize that common sense knowledge and make an, a simple, easy way to use that people will know no longer uh, click on links and emails. You know, everyone in your organization. So I was talking with this Tomas last night. He said that he was at a security conference and they emailed him his credit card information. Says, "Is this is this correct? Please verify this. His credit card number, his name, and his address." And so that was at a security conference. That you know, because of the fact that there's some support staff there that don't realize what we all think is common sense, and that's really the problem right there. You've, you know, you could make a lot of money if you could monetize or productize what we consider common sense. And if you would try to speak at Black Hat saying why I make my password 40 characters rather than 29, that's just not something that you're going to get accepted. Everyone who uses technology is a practitioner in information security. So cyber civilians want to accomplish their goal, and attackers are motivated by a you know, number of different means. Um, you know, if you think about it and you try to compare it to physical space, you know, in this case, there is, everyone is on the same battle zone. It's not like the soldiers are out there and they're fighting the war with other professional soldiers and we're over here sitting around and we're not going to get shelled. There, everyone's in the same playing field and everyone is on the same battleground. That's really the only difference between our industry and I mean, physical space, meat space. Attackers, what are they motivated by? Well, money. So, uh, you know, the easiest way to make you money will provide the highest return on investment. And so, that's why they're not going to spend a lot of time building an amazing ROPT, anti ROPT or a ROPT chain that bypasses Emmet 5.1 at zero day when they can just send out, hey, check out this sweet game.exe or you know, photo.jpeg.exe, and most of the time they're going to make some profit. I mean, spam, people wouldn't do it if they don't get a couple users to click on and enter their credit card information. And how anyone could read that thing that makes no sense and has random words in there to get past spam filters would ever think that you know, would be profitable, but they still do it. Uh, I had someone talk, it was a finance company. They got breached and uh, the attacker didn't even realize they had breached a finance firm. And they weren't monetizing all this high frequency trading and account information. They stole the UPS account and were just mailing stuff for free. And like selling stolen goods on eBay. That was their, how they were going to monetize that very quickly. Uh, and then there's the really scary ones, right? The revenge attack. So this is like things like Sony where you're not in the pack. You know, you're not like being chased by a bear with your friends and you just got to outrun the slowest person. That bear is like, I want to get that guy. And that's a really scary situation. And their goal is more destruction, not necessarily hiding their tracks. Um, and so that right here you see with the Sony attack where they're out there and rather than monetizing all this information, all this EP IP they've stolen, they're just releasing it out to destroy and, you know, Watch the world burn. And then there's fun. So these guys, they usually aim for soft targets, and then they move on to find their next little game. And I would not say that they're really malicious in the sense that they don't really want to harm people. We were talking about this earlier in the sense that you know, our current excuse me, state of the art is, is be trivial for probably 90% of the people in this room to hack into a power station from their laptop right here and cause a massive catastrophic failure. And why doesn't that happen? It's because now you're going from just doing something that people think is a fairly victimless crime, where 
oh, I steal someone's credit card information, they get a thing in the mail saying you've got to update your password and here's your new credit card. It's sort of kind of a minor inconvenience. But if you're at the point where you're actually then causing catastrophic failure, you've gone back into the point where you know, it's just like people who have no problem pirating music would not go into a store and steal that CD. And there's kind of these different kind of thing where you think, oh, I'm not really that bad of a person. All I did is run some scripts. Uh, and it's also that kind of bringing it back to that quote from Stalin saying, you know, a thousand people, a thousand people dying is a statistic, but one is a tragedy. If you grab some, you know, credit card dump and it has 10,000 rows, you're like, sweet, that's 10,000 times four dollars or whatever the going rate is. You're not thinking that's that one person that I just killed or I made their job really hard or they're out of a job. So technical debt, a lot of people from the development side know this, but not a lot of security folks keep on this. And so it's kind of uh, tracking the gap between uh, what you have right now or your minimum viable product and the perfect world. So especially in the startup scene or a new development effort, you make kind of shortcuts. You're like, oh, I should really do it this way. This would be a lot easier to maintain. This is a much cleaner design. But you know, we got to get out to market first. We know our competitors are coming out with a similar product. We're going to kind of uh, we're going to try to jump the gun, and we'll acknowledge that. And so this is actually a way that you know VPs of engineering or CTOs can communicate with their board and saying, here, like, this is the debt we're taking on, and these are the risks. And as long as you guys are willing to take on that risk and down the road, you know, pay that off or maybe face some consequences for that, that's what it's going to take for us to get out with the current resources. And so they can use this in monetary terms to say, hey, if you give us an extra 100 grand right now in the development process, it'll be a lot, save us a lot more time in the long run. I mean, a lot of these systems you see running, especially in the finance industry, are still running on IBM mainframes written in COBOL. And now they're facing, you know, really struggling trying to find people that can program in COBOL and they're paying them outrageous salaries because they wrote their software in a dead language or, and it just kind of keeps going on. So the cost overall of them having the software is far beyond what it costs them to develop. And so with that, you know, maintenance over your life cycle may rapidly outstrip your initial investment. And so that's kind of the balance. But if you take on no technical debt, you're never going to get out to market because you're going to be focused on making the personal, you know, the best product ever and you're going to write it in Haskell and then you'll never actually come out to the real world. So your trusted code base, your trusted computing base, this is the amount of code that's part of your privilege container. Uh, and so what I like to say with privilege, you know, there's administrator privilege, there's operating system or kernel privilege, hypervisor. But I think the one that's really the, at the end of the day that matters is who has access or what code has access to your sensitive data. There's a statistic that I can't remember off the top of my head that 3% of an organization's data accounts for between like 70 to 90% of that, per, that company's publicly held value if it's a public company. And so that right there, like that data, whoever has access to that, whatever code has access to that, whatever vendors have access to that are who you should be concerned about. And then also think about humans, like as we talked about in the keynote, uh, the lowly paid DBA that has access to all your data or the help desk guy that could really easily go in and make you know, his yearly salary three times over by just changing someone's password for someone. So your goal is to shrink who you know, what your trusted computing base is to as small as possible. And then if you can measure using trusted computing or protect this code base, uh, and then you hope that, you know, you're not going to be able to access that sensitive data. Unfortunately, mapping this out is extraordinarily difficult. Um, so, you know, your Intel legacy boot process. So this is, you bought a new Dell, your vendor organization, you vetted Dell as a great organization. They're rated A with the better beer, you know, business bureau and whatnot. You push the button, and now BIOS is loaded into RAM. And now you're trusting the BIOS venue, venue BIOS vendor, which is hatched and checked usually, but it's, again, it could have bugs in it. And then you're loading any option ROMs off devices or EFI drivers on newer systems. Now you're trusting your GPU vendor, your NIC vendor, your RAID vendor. And I didn't see this on the side of the Dell saying you should you know, form an agreement with NVIDIA and Sand, uh, Seagate and uh, whichever NIC provider. And then your BIOS loads your operating system for, from disk. So you obviously you're trusting Microsoft or Linux. Um, and then you could have a hypervisor dri driver as well. And so then like the new um, Windows 8 and newer comes with their Hyper-V hypervisor pre-installed. And you just got to go in and tick the box. And so now you're trusting at all levels, all these vendors, 
before your application or even got into the login prompt. And you haven't gone through the vendor vetting process for all of this. Now your application is running. So any libraries you use, any libraries you link against, or in any of these other privileged applications, uh, drivers for every device you install. So the Face Dancer from Travis is a great example of you emulate some random device and some driver, especially in Linux, that was written by some guy who got this device from China and he really wanted to make it work. He's not a software engineer. He doesn't work for that company. He just wanted to make it work. You plug it in, it's going to load that guy's code that's probably written very poorly. And so his Face Dancer is a fuzzer for USB devices. And it's pretty crazy how many crashes you can get just by randomly emulating USB devices. And then everything running with privilege over your application. So your antivirus, which I think HBSS is over 10 million lines of code. Um, there was a great uh, talk at ShmooCon by Mudge where he showed a graph of the size of code. So you have all the exploits and the offensive code has remained static for the last 20 years at about 200 lines of code. And then you see how big the defensive software is. So the first firewall, maybe 100 or 1,000 lines of code. And now you see this exponential growth to HBSS, which is like the McAfee endpoint protection, at 10 million lines of code. Uh, and so you know, then you have your digital, your uh, DLP, your operating system, your hypervisor. So you have all this code that's running with more privilege over your application. A bug in any of these could be an entry point. Or you could just have a business that maybe is doing something malicious to you, but not for them. So FTDI makes USB devices, and they were really concerned about counterfeit USB devices. And so they wrote software that was signed by Microsoft, because they're a trusted vendor, that would, when you connected your device, if it was counterfeit, it would brick the device. And so that was their business goals coming before yours. You're just someone who bought a USB stick. You don't sure which factory it came from in China and whether they were using legitimate or counterfeit devices, which are very hard to tell. You plug your device into your Windows computer, and now it's broken. Because FTDI has a vested interest in not having counterfeit devices work. But you as your organization or you as just yourself kind of wanted that USB to work so you can copy your presentation somewhere. And then again, you know, do you vet these vendors in your typical vendor evaluation process? So we're going to talk about some low-level attack. Uh, these are very unlikely to be used for your organization. Uh, Bruce Schreiner talks about uh, movie plot terrorist attacks. And so he has a contest every year where you come up with a terrorist attack, which would be great in a movie, but really unrealistic. And so these right here are those exactly, in that they're just there to highlight that an attacker could probably always find in if they're sufficiently determined. And if you've gotten a sufficiently determined attacker, you're already failing. And then, uh, so you basically want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So the first one I want to talk about is one of my favorites by Red Balloon called Stepping Pones in 2013. Uh, they created a PDF that included the instructions for an HP printer to update its firmware to the uh, new firmware image that they had embedded, which was running MIPS. So your typical desktop AV, all good here because it's just MIPS instructions. It doesn't actually show up as anything. And it was no PDF virus. It didn't actually impact your, your desktop computer at all. And then he would email it to an HR folk and say, hey, I really like to work for you guys. Here's my resume. Would you mind printing it out and, uh, and sending it around just to see if people are interested? As soon as they push print, it updates the HP printer, which reverse shells back to him. And then it would pivot through that and infect every desk phone, like the Cisco you know, desktop phones, and all the smart switches as well. It would then do a network inventory of all the devices that it hacked. And if any one of those went away, but the IP address or the MAC address was still in the network, maybe you reset your phone or you upgraded the version, it would then go through and re-attack that so that you have to shut down everything at once, reflash all your devices, which I don't even know how you would do that like for some of those devices, and then reset everything back up. And so that right there is like the scariest thing. And I've never thought of that attack vector. And probably no normal CISO should think of that attack vector. But if you had someone that was that suspicious or that you know, determined, you're in trouble. This was one from last year. Corey Kallenberg and Zinokova, who now have their own gig called uh, Legbacore. They showed that the reference implementation of the EFI BIOS had bugs in it, which is actually really nice because it 
finding BIOS bugs used to be like a really tedious process with like special, you know, disassembling, but now they're all open source, made by Intel. And they showed that uh, most people who make EFI just copy and paste that reference implementation and change the logo. So the same bug they found in the reference implementation that was never supposed to be actually deployed, they found in like multiple EFI vendors. Uh, and then they could escalate from a user application with admin privileges to system management mode, which is more privilege than a hypervisor. Uh, and so that was a um, pretty uh, scary attack in the sense that rather than just doing a privilege escalation from like, you know, administrator access to kernel access, they went all the way above everything. So uh, that was a scary attack. Some of my work from uh, last year showed that you could use the x86 hardware to hide malware from operating system protections and antivirus. So there's a Shadow Walker rootkit. Um, it basically uses how the hardware is laid out for uh, power efficiency and for speed purposes that uh, logically acts as one unit, but it is physically two separate components. Um, and you can activate that to bypass you know, patch guard or antivirus because it has a different view of memory depending on if you're executing at that address versus uh, reading at that address. <clears throat> so what it does is it provides a split view of memory data versus code. So an antivirus that's scanning address and you're scanning your kernel space, they'll see everything as benign, but if you actually jump to that region of code, you're gonna go somewhere else. All right, so a little bit more background on another attack. Uh, so paging in virtual memory is a protective feature or a promise. So the first code in, your first code that can kind of start your computer, your operating system or your BIOS, kind of gets control and then uh, this kind of feature, the virtual memory helps pretend to protect your operating system from applications that might try to break out. Before this came out, like back in the DOS days, a misbehaving application could overwrite your kernel with no problems. Um, and unless you can access the page tables, you're locked out. And so this is kind of an attack as well. Um, so the goal was is how would you map in arbitrary physical memory? And so it's kind of this chicken and the egg problem where uh, you want to be able to modify the page tables to map in the page tables in your process. And you don't know how to do that unless you have access to the page tables. So it's kind of like a catch-22 or a chicken before the egg problem. Um, and so the use case, you have some kernel shell code. You found a, a you know, buffer overflow or attack against the kernel. You want to be able to kind of get that to actually be able to contact everything that might not be mapped into that driver's space, live memory forensics, et cetera. So you have access, but you're confined to an operating system controlled mappings. Um, so you can't access a device, you can't access the network card directly uh, to be able to say exfiltrate data if you're doing a memory scraping attack. And we wanted to do it in an OS independent way. So um, you know where the tables are in physical memory because of the CR3 register stores that. But that's the physical memory address, not the virtual address. And so you can't map those tables in and without having the page tables already mapped in, which sounds repetitive because it is. Uh, so OSs usually have a hard-coded value. So in Windows, it's like C and all zeros. Um, and Linux just has an identity map. So virtual addresses are the same as physical addresses. Uh, but OS-specific attacks are, are pretty lame. So we're going to look at the architecture. Um, and so you also don't know where your code is executing because you can't access the page tables. So to be able to, uh, to do this attack, to be able to um, do this attack I'm gonna show you, you need to control 32 bits of memory at a known physical location. Uh, and that's the crux. Once you have 32 bits of access at a known physical location, you can then set up a recursive mapping back to the physical page tables, and then go through and modify one, and then switch everything back. Uh, conveniently, uh, every device with PCI Express has this. Uh, it's a nice little architectural feature in PCI Express called ECAM, the Enhanced Configuration Access Mechanism. So people who've done uh, driver development, they'll use uh, the CF8, CFC is probably a pretty common set of port IO addresses that you're familiar with. That's how you configure devices. You say, this is the memory range I want you to work on. Turn off, turn on, this is power control. Uh, and so PCI Express has much more configuration information as these devices have gotten much more powerful. And port IO is extraordinarily slow. So you need a faster way to access it. So the ECAM shadows device configuration space into your physical memory. And that's done at the chipset. So now you can just access using memory mapped IO, you just access memory and all those structures and tables are there. And the base address is stored in your PCI uh, in a register that you can read from port IO. So what we did 
was uh, constructed a page directory entry that maps in the current OS page tables. Um, so we used a CR3 value and set up that up. We utilized port IO to insert it onto the PCI device, and then we trick the CPU into thinking that it is actually accessing the page tables from memory when in fact it's actually talking to a device, which should never happen. The CPU should never be reading you know, con configuration information off of a device. Um, and then you can determine the physical location from that address, uh, and then you're all set. So the real question is, is where do you get those 32 bits of memory? Because if you were just to overwrite something on PCI space, you might crash your system, you might destroy a device, or at least have it crash. And this is the best part. I was like, where can I put this? And so I was reading through the Intel manuals, as I'm wont to do for a good night in. And shit you not, they have a register called Scratch Pad Data. And the description is, this is for random software use. It has no impact on the system just to store things on USB device. And they have multiple of these all over their devices, on their memory controller hub, on their uh, disk devices. And so you have 32 bits of storage right on the memory controller hub. And so uh, device zero, function zero. And then you do a little bit of math. Change your CR3 to point to PCI configuration space. You scan the real page directory for an empty entry. You create a recursive one back that you know what the address will be. And then in like 20 lines of assembly, uh, there's a lot of like weird caching stuff you got to do, but we'll skip all that. Um, so then, you know, what, what is this, right? So uh, there's some alignment caveats. You need these PCI registers, and it requires ring zero and global pages. Uh, I was going to present this, and then I heard back from Rodrigo, who said, well, yeah, you need ring zero, so it's not really that exciting. I said, OK, well, I'll just find a way to do it from ring three. So that's kind of uh, what I did. Um, so you can actually do it from ring three to ring zero by using the hard drive to DMA. So you can actually access physical memory unless you have an IOMMU. So the design flaws here, you have feature creep, right? So you have some kind of previous architectural guarantee. You say this is you know, kind of what this product provides. And uh, then you say, hey, well, this is a new feature that I really need. And they provide more performance, but it violates your previous assumptions. This has happened before. So the SMM caching bug, virtual machine side channels, et cetera, where they come out with a new feature that puts a new management bullet point on their product, where you can only fit one. There's only like one. You can only say secure once on a product sheet. But you can put other features on there as many times as you want. And so if you create new features, then you're going to sell more product rather than just saying security four more times. Really? OK, cool. So attackers are lazy, much like most of us, in the sense that they're incentivized. If they're out for money, they want to do it with investing as little amount of time as possible. So there was a great talk by. Uh, Andreas, right? Yeah. And uh, he talked about an attack that, you know, from a technical black hat perspective, was, oh, just a JavaScript bug. But from an attacker perspective, that's going to make you tons of money, and you're going to be rich, and you're going to be living on your yacht, and you don't care what people black hat think, because you're living on your yacht. So they're not necessarily lazy. They're just incentivized by doing the least amount of work for the largest amount of payoff, just like us. If I could get a job that paid me $10 million an hour, I would take it and just work for a few hours. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a lot easier to attack a legacy service running under some employee's thing that they set up by themselves under, outside of your organizational control than a fully patched and firewalled server in your, your, your NOC. So you, know, you have that Lockheed trademarked cyber kill chain. And you aim for a soft target first, and then you pivot. And you perform recon in the network, and you pivot laterally. And this may happen multiple times as you kind of get closer and closer to whatever your goal is. And so a lot of organizations focus on your perimeter defense. And so they kind of have this, uh, this hard exterior with the soft GUI um, filling. And what they don't realize is that vendors are already in there. And so a lot of times, it's much easier to you know, a compromise an HVAC solution provider, and then compromise all of the people that they provide AC to. And that was, I think, the attack vector for Target, was their HVAC provider had to have a direct line into their system, and it wasn't properly isolated. And so they were actually hacked by the AC, or the AC 
and heater guy. And then once the imperimeter has been breached, you know, you're kind of game over because, you know, basically your network is part of your trusted code base. A lot of organizations, if you're on the network, you can access shared files, you can access things. And so just being on that network is kind of authentication itself, which is not really what you want. You want to actually, you know, have authentication over all the devices that are connecting to your data. But instead, you're just saying anything I plug into this network is automatically authenticated. And so we do user authentication, perhaps, but not necessarily machine authentication. So that's where this whole market for the, the Pony Plug Express came from, is if I can break into someone's uh, you know, office and drop this tiny little device in there, now I'm authenticated and I can connect to it over 3G or 4G. So you kind of have your internet, you have your firewall you set up, um, and then you inside your network you have services, applications, and user machines that are all kind of trusted. And so you see that in the Internet Explorer, Internet settings, they have the trusted zone, which is green and is happy. And basically you'll run ActiveX on anything from the network because that's, that's fine. You're in the trusted zone. What if you could shift to the point where your user machines are just as untrusted as your home machine? So you see this when people move to the cloud. So Google apps for government, Google apps for corporations. If I'm logging into Gmail for work, um, you know, Gmail trusts my computer just as much as it trusts another organ uh, computer. And so they have two-factor authentication, and you can really consolidate your data into one place, which is gonna be a harder target and a more uh, exciting target, for sure. But you can then focus on uh, protecting that rather than protecting your entire organization. And so that's where you can get some cost savings. It's so obvious, it's the least privileged principle you're just applying it to your network design and not just your user accounts. You're going to shrink the trusted code base by deprivileging like someone's random Bonzi buddy that's running on their network, their corporate machine. Um, and then you're shrinking you know, to only include these few applications that actually host that 3% of your data. And then you know, if I'm doing OSINT on your, your, uh, your environment and I'm trying to um, you know, figure out how I can break in, if I compromise your organization's office network by going out there and dropping USB keys on your computer, on, on your uh, parking lot, that's doing a lot less for me. Um, and then less trust of unknown entities as well. A lot of trust questions with cloud providers and whatnot, but hand wave that away for right now. So the million dollar question, how do you communicate that security can be a value add or at least not just another cost? Uh, so what do you need in an organization standpoint? You need a common language to be able to speak with folks. As the keynote said, you know, you can't really go to the board and say, hey, this Heartbleed attack, you know, it's a memory disclosure bug and this is what's going to happen. They're going to just kind of say, okay, whatever. Uh, you need to have some language that everyone can speak so that they can bring in their you know, great wisdom from risk analysis, uh, and then be able to kind of apply that to this other domain. You want to have a really good holistic view of threats and who your adversary is. Are you being directly targeted because you're a company that people hate? I'm sure Monsanto has a different adversary than a mom and pop store that allows you to buy picture frames. Um, and then you need some kind of metric to track your progress and then any return on investment. And then knowing when security can, should take the, back, you know, the, the second stage or the back, you know, kind of just be there behind the business goals and uh, say enough is enough. So, you know, you want to implement this less is more. You can slim your operations and your minimized costs in the long run. Why? So this is a great kind of thing that came from the keynote this morning is we know the state of security is pretty poor. But who is that actually harming? And I would say you guys the most because as he showed today, if you get breached, the company doesn't care. Like was it one of the companies had like a 200% stock increase after they got breached. That was Lockheed. Um, so they're fine. The customers, they're going to grumble a little bit. They might have to you know, deny a couple charges or change their credit card or have to call their credit monitoring service for one little while. So they're going to grumble, but you know, they're not going to leave. And then you or you're on Indeed.com looking for a new job. But now you can say you have experience in instant response. 
So this is a very like selfish uh, goal is why you want to really think about it. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to do a cost benefit analysis of an organization that gets breached and then hires Mandiant to come and tell them it was China and like how they can not get hacked again versus just firing the CISO so they can say they did it and do nothing different because it's not really showing that much of a difference in their stock price or their market share. And paying Mandiant money at all is just like that's a cost that they were going to have to, to, to bear. So to protect your organization, who are you trying to defend against? Low-hanging fruit attackers? So this, everyone should be out of this category. If you're getting you know, hit because you have one of the top 25 passwords on your firewall remote login, you deserve to be attacked. Like that's, that's terrible. And so that's an automated attacker. That's a script kitty. That's uh, you know, just someone who's playing around. Like what does this tool do? Um, are you being compromised by everyday thieves who are looking for profit and don't really care where it's coming from? Just like that example I gave of the financial firm that got breached. They would be happy with any company with a UPS number. And every company has a UPS number, or at least in the US. So they don't really care about your company in particular. Or are you looking at this you know, advanced persistent targeted threat, I would say, advanced targeted threat rather than persistent threat, that's looking at your company specifically. This might be corporate espionage, or it might just be someone with a grudge, an ex-employee or uh, someone with some uh, like political aspirations. And that would be, you know, and they're invested in exploitation. So this is not threat intelligence or pen testing. They have different goals. Threat intelligence goal is to make money for the threat intelligence company. And pen testing is to find some answer that the pen testing company, you know, they, they want to find something and then they want to give you that report. So their goal is to like be paid to write a report. Whereas that not necessarily lines up with what all adversaries are looking for. And so they have slightly different goals. So you want to think about your adversary. And pen testing is part of that. And you want to make sure that you know, no one with an automated script can compromise you. But at the same time, you also want to think about what kind of person would be running those scripts in the real world. And so are you one of many, or, how do you, or do you stand out? And so that's like a really big one in the sense that if you're just another mom and pop picture frame company, you know, if I want to really co compromise a picture frame company and you're really secure and someone else is really less secure, it doesn't really matter to me. But if you are an evil picture frame company, then I'm going to go for you. And I'm really, you know, I really, you stand out. Uh, and then, you know, what motivates them and how do you shift their behavior? So if they're motivated by money, how do you just say, yeah, that's the cost of business, letting them have my UPS account, that's fine, as long as they don't break into, you know, my account information. Your organization is not monolithic. This is segmentation. So, you know, having the same security posture or perimeter-based protection for your entire organization when some people are doing is shipping and receiving and some people are doing, you know, development R&D, that's a waste of money right there. And so what I'm trying to advocate is, like, let the people who have very little impact get hacked and just consider that your cost of business or get cyber liability insurance. It's very easy these days. And then focus on really like those crown jewels, that 3% of your data. And then you want to look at your research, you know, competitors to compare. So if you're running from a non-targeted bear, you want to outrun the other guy, not the bear, as long as you're above the low-hanging fruit threshold. And also, this is from a business perspective, if you know that your competitors are way worse than you and the auditors come knocking, you can say, hey, you should check out those guys. They're really awful. And then let them deal with the auditors or the compliance and regulatory folks for years while you get up to speed and everything you know, all set and done. You really, OK, you can sell something you cannot measure. I should have said that too. You shouldn't sell something you cannot measure or ethically. Um, so they have to be understandable to everyone who's reading them. Like a, if I give you how many, what, KPIs, I think is the term we use, or how many patches you've set out and deployed across your network, that's fantastic. But unless I understand what that actually means and how that's going to impact me, it's a pretty useless metric. So I'm kind of using this, and it's not my creation, but information security debt is perfect for that. So you use a similar model to translate your technical details into a fiscal or a risk model that you can align with your business goals. And so you're there to support the business goals. And so this is kind of how we're going to go about this. It's uh, a little bit more difficult to quantify, but so is technical debt exactly. So you know, your devices are risks, remembering all those implicit vendors you trust. 
devices also have maintenance costs, patching, IT support, lo monitoring, log data, the people who are going to look through Splunk or set up in your, in your SOC. You're also going to inventory your data because data is a liability on your balance sheet if it's breached. And I already talked about this. So predict out your costs and figure out would a product A or would this approach to security be better over the long run, even if it costs a little bit more now. And then that's something that you can communicate to your, you know, your organizational stakeholders. Uh, and so you want to find a balance between security, usability, slash support of the business goals. Because if you have no information security debt, you have no computers and no people. How much debt is too much, too little? Well, you never want to invest more than your data is worth. I mean, it's, that's just foolish. But some people, they try to go for the 100% secure, which is really, in most cases, not ever worth it. And you know, would you rather save some more infosec debt or technical debt to trade off for more business growth? Can we be a little bit more aggressive and put more stuff out to market and offer a faster service if we cut down on this, but we're going to accept that we might get breached a little bit quicker? That's some decision that you need to make. And so technical debt kind of grows at a fairly normal rate. So people quit, new software comes out, or languages slowly die and become less popular, and it's harder and harder to find a COBOL developer. But nothing really fundamentally changes that makes your technical decisions you made five years ago really change. So information security debt, you can think of like a variable rate mortgage. So you might be fine one day, and then someone comes out with a zero day that's already in an exploit kit or is already in a scanner now that's being automated and put out through that. So like if you all saw, as soon as Heartbleed came out, you know, Rob Graham was there scanning within like 20 minutes. And I saw his access on my access log, him trying to, or Shellshock rather. And so that's something where using OpenSSL was OK. Well, we thought it was OK. And then all of a sudden, it was really not OK. And so that's kind of like where you get this variable rate spikes. Um, and then you, know, you have legacy applications and appliances, which also impact that. If you can't get your log data into some SIM or some you know, Splunk-based tool, then that's going to be a lot harder and a lot more manual for you to actually you know, use that information. And then vendors really quickly stop patching. Like, look at Android phones. I mean, my phone was the S5, and already like, I don't get fixes. I think I'm still vulnerable to the freak attack. Like, and that was a phone that came out like a year ago. So, you know, that's another benefit, you know, another, you know, risk you have is that your vendor is going to stop caring. I had the, I got screwed twice, actually. I had the Mego phone from Nokia, and uh, I bought it just, they said, oh, yeah, we're, we're sold to Microsoft now, and we're shutting down the product, we're not supporting it. So I got no updates for that, which is very sad. So, you know, from these low-level attacks, a sufficiently determined attacker who's looking at you specifically, or a nation state capability if you're the government, uh, they'll be able to find a way into your network, even if that means paying someone to get a job at your company and the help desk, and then just say, hey, I'll pay you double what you make to do this. I mean, that's not necessarily a model that you're going to be able to buy a tool for. Barracoo doesn't sell this, you know, some of these attacks. Um, and so what you need to do is you need to model your risk and your adversary and then protect accordingly, and then focus on what actually matters and what let yourself get breached. You know, like everything that we do in life is kind of you know, probabilistic. Like there's a non-zero chance that when I fly to Singapore next week, it'll get hit by a Ukrainian or Russian missile and I will die. That's not you know, a certainty, but I'm still going to get on that plane because I'm going to derive enjoyment not from the flight itself, but from, from the trip. And so. We need to realize that being 100% secure is not something we really want, nor is it something that we should ever really get to. Just like, you know, the first time I learned about probabilistic algorithms, I was very frightened. I was like, wait, this is math that might not be right. How is that, how is that working in my, my life view? And then I realized, well, driving to class today was also probabilistically a bad idea, or uh, you know, something that you need to weigh in your risk. So there's a, uh, a YouTube video by the Lonely Island, the people who do I'm on a boat, and it's called YOLO. You ought to look out. And it's all about living your life with no risks and like overcooking your turkey to kill salmonella. And, and so that's kind of like one way, the kind of the way we're trying to look at security is you ought to look out rather than this is our life. And as long as the business is thriving, which we haven't really seen any examples of it really tanking an organization, you know, let's, let's live a little. 
uh, and information security can provide a return on investment in the sense that you're might saving costs. If you move your security into the design phase, kind of like a DevOps approach, it's going to cost a lot less for security to be kind of built in rather than bolted on. And then measuring and tracking this information security debt at least allows you to show a metric of you're getting worse, you're getting better, and then you, know, you can kind of compare vendors uh, objectively. So with that, I'll open the floor to questions about pretty much anything. So thank you. Oh, which doesn't, I don't want to like uh, uh, devaluate the, the value of your questions. Actually, they're very welcome. Um. Well, conceptually, this approach uh, matches the risk reward equilibrium and things like that. But um, uh, KPIs, uh, which was, is what we're trying to do, measuring the, are there, do you have any tool that you use in practice? I mean, we developed rapid risk assessment, and it doesn't boil the ocean. It, simply poses a question and tells you which decision might be better based on your your posture uh, or your uh, concept of risk and reward. Uh, but do you, have you developed any tools? Or do you kind of this is more a process than a tool. And so you could do this with Excel, or you could do it probably with a GRC tool as well. But uh, it, it's more about how you look holistically to support your organization rather than a specific tool that you use. And so that's what I'm trying to advocate for is putting, kind of boiling down the technical details into something that an informed board member or CIO could then act upon. And so they have a lot of experience and they're like tasked to guide the business in an appropriate way using kind of risk-based you know, assessments, but they don't understand the technology. So this is basically just a way to kind of translate and hope that those people who have an overview of the entire company, because there's a lot of risks that aren't information security risk. There's physical security. There's the power going out if you're in a, you know, a different country or whatnot. And so there's a lot of risk they need to balance. And they're the only ones that have that oversight. And so we're kind of, we tend to over, you know, say the sky is falling with computer security. But a lot of times, you know, that might not be, that's just a piece of the pie when you look at it from overview. And so this is a way to kind of communicate that up to the board members who are the ones that really have that oversight or sh should really have that oversight across the entire business. Because information security might not really be worth it. I mean, we've shown that you, know, you get hacked and you double your stock value in a year or two. And so if that's what really it means, they might say, all right, we'll just pay a little bit for uh, cyber liability insurance. If we install FireEye, it'll save us 20% of that fee. And so we'll just do that and then we're good. And then they're done. So that's kind of you know a decision they need to make, but they need to be informed of what the risks are in a way that's not necessarily like a, uh, a specific technical information like this product versus that product. More about the risks and the rewards of this product versus for that one. All right, here we go. I think the companies that are doing this right perhaps are the worst examples of security. So organizations I find that have very highly paid staff or very specialized staff. Uh, so you look at uh, hospitals or law firms. They typically have very poor information security because their doctors are paid so much that it's very difficult for someone to say, you're going to use two-factor authentication. You're in the ER, your patient is crashing, and you need to order drugs from your automated system. Now you've got to pull out this token, and oh, it's out of batteries, and this guy is dead, and you have blood on your fingers. I mean, what are you going to do? So they push back. And so a lot of times you see that, where they're like, oh, we're going to use this new application for our phone or our new security program. The doctors say no, or oh, it's going to cost me an extra $10,000 a week 
to pay these people extra to learn this new thing and to use it. And so they actually have a really good model in the sense that you know, they're driven by their business. And so you see that a lot more where they'll sacrifice user experience, like almost very, very little when they're uh, you know, very highly paid staff that's not in the information security perspective. I don't think people use organizations or use these really expensive tools and threat modeling and all that stuff if it's going to impact their users when their users are make or when their users they're paying five hundred dollars an hour to try to figure out how this thing works. Yeah, and that was from the keynote again, how everyone switched to OS X, which I think even today still has way worse security than the comparable Windows version. Like at least in Pwn to Own, it seems like OS X is always the first one to go. Like I think they just last released moved to 64-bit operating systems so they have the full ASLR with. And that's because of user experience. And we, that's something that we kind of, we need to be able to communicate with people who do user experience and be able to kind of translate you know, the technical goals. So again, you know, that's, that's exactly right, where the user experience and the usability is one of the biggest problems, not necessarily the really technical, you know, in the weeds, technical challenges. So you have to say Apple got it right, Microsoft got it wrong. <coughs> more care, more and, care. From that, again, from, from and, that. And now they're yeah. investing in security, right? And so if you read their iOS security guidelines for their phones, it came out last February, I believe, it's really, really well li uh, laid out, and it's very well thought out, and it's also public, so other organizations can build on top of that. But they focused on the usability to get people to want to buy it first, and then they kind of augmented the security. Uh, and so that's kind of coming back to the fact where if you can get your staff to want to use that, and your, your lawyers say, oh, if you give me a corporate black bear, I'm just not going to use it. And then they say, okay, well, you can do whatever you want, because we want you to be able to check your email and respond to clients wherever you are. Thanks again, Jacob. Thank you. Very much like that. Yeah, okay. So.